Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hey everyone, I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Good to see you this week. Hey, let's get ready to take on a new month. And we're starting our show again with weather and we can cross our fingers that the forecast for June will be a bit better than what we've seen during other parts of the year. A wet May continued to delay planting and that of course was on top of the flooded fields and ranches that many have been experiencing. Nebraska Extension has experts all over the state to help out and answer questions as to how your operation can recover. And we had Nebraska Extension Director Dr. Chuck Hibbard join the show to explain what's been done and what's still to come. Our short-term efforts really starting from day one, March 13, 14, 15, uh, our folks were on the ground working uh, with uh, uh, the local operations center, emergency operations center, uh, to connect with farmers, livestock owners, to help them figure out what they needed to do under very dire circumstances. Chuck Hibbard beams when talking about the long hours his extension staff has put in since the flood disaster began. Still, he knows the recovery is far from over. What began with connecting crop and livestock producers to assistance, coordinating volunteer efforts, and surveying damage has now turned into a long-term plan one that FEMA says could take over nine years to fully recover from. Since then, we've really shifted into high gear in terms of just trying to help uh, certainly people involved in ag production, primarily livestock producers, figure out, you know, what do I do with uh, animals that are missing or animals that are injured or uh, 19 miles of fence that are gone, those kinds of things, or five feet of sand deposited on my uh, uh, center pivot farm. So really going forward, it's a continu continuation of those kinds of activities uh, to help people make sure people have the right information so they can make really good decisions. Extension has also been working with homeowners. More than 3,400 homes were destroyed or damaged from the floods. But damage to any property, be it home, field, or livestock, can take its toll. That's why Extension is working to make sure farmers are focused on their mental well-being during this difficult time, too. I don't think anybody should be embarrassed to admit, you know, that they're grieving because of the live loss of livestock or they're just challenged with the economic status of their operation. And so we've been working hard to try to provide better mental health support, but then also trying to do those kinds of things that uh, will help people see a path forward because Right now it's hard when you're trying to dig out uh, you know, a home or whatever, trying to rebuild fence. I mean, that's the focus, that's the project. We gotta help, uh, try to help uh, people figure out how to keep moving forward. That means moving forward together. And if you're still struggling, you aren't alone. First of all, I'd just like you to know that uh, we're here with you. We wanna help in any way we can. Uh, we have resources that might be helpful to you. Uh, the other, the second part of that is please reach out. You're not in this alone. And so uh, connect with Extension if uh, you're comfortable with that. There are other service providers that uh, are more than willing to help you, to work with you. Uh, I, uh, I really encourage people to, uh, to do that uh, because, uh, you, you know, you are not in this alone. It's, it, is, it is truly a team effort. Chuck also told me about the Flood Recovery Service Ship Program. 50 University of Nebraska students will be dispersed to work in communities that are in the flood zone. And as we've told you before, all the flood resources you need can be found at flood.unl.edu. The address is right there on the screen. Time for markets now. And last week, we had some breaking news regarding a second round of market facilitation program aid from the USDA. Now, this will be a direct payment to eligible producers to offset the pains of the ongoing trade war with China. We've got lots to break down with this topic. So on Tuesday, I was joined by Dr. Scott Irwin, an agricultural economist at the University of Illinois, to discuss what options you have. I think it's useful to think about it from two different levels. One level is if you can and will plant, the way the program will operate is that it's a direct payment to uh, everyone in a county at exactly the same rate. So if all 
crops are getting the same payment in a county, then strangely enough, even though we don't know what that amount is, even if we knew it, it you would reach the same decision. You, you wouldn't change what you're going to plant because all crops get the same payment. On a second level, however, and this is where the really big uncertainty was introduced by the MFP2 announcement, is that the new program apparently, although we do not have the final word on this, is coupled with respect to the plant no plant. In other words, you have to plant something in 2019 to be eligible for the MFP2 payment, whatever it turns out to be. And for a lot of farmers here in Nebraska who want to take advantage of that MFP aid, the choice that they're trying to make is uh, things like, you know, do I try and plant corn late or do I pivot toward soybeans or uh, maybe do I want to plant a less expensive crop? Do any of those options appeal to you more than another? Well, the good news is for those Nebraska farmers that um, are in a position where they can plant something and they have that option, uh, mm -hmm. they should just go with whatever whatever the market economics dictate. And that is a complicated decision like it is in every year based on a particular farmer's circumstances, costs, uh, rent. You know, there's no hard and fast rule about what should be done at this point, other than I'm pretty confident that the planting date research in Nebraska is probably not that different than here in Illinois. And in particular, if you're faced with planting corn in particular uh, after the first few days of June, that is a very risky enterprise in terms of what kind of yield hit you might take, uh, running into harvesting and maturity problems in the fall, drying costs, uh, so that would be my advice. Uh, any situation where you're looking at planting, uh, you know, after the first few days of June, you know, think it through really, really carefully. And I wanted to go back to corn planting for a second. You've also authored that new report where you studied the implications of late corn planting. Is there anything else from that report that you'd like to share? Well, I think, honestly, we're all a little bit breathless after the crop report progress report today came in, you know, as of uh, May 26th, we had 58% of the U.S. corn crop planted, which means that there's, roughly speaking, 39 million acres of corn unplanted right now, maybe in the last couple of like, days. Like, do we even bit. have anything to compare that to? No, there really isn't anything in the, at least the last 40 years of data that I've looked at. Uh, this is really unprecedented. Uh, I took a look uh, in last week at the three years in the 90s, uh, which are comparable in terms of the degree of late planting the way I define it, which is as of May 20th, and that was 1993, 1995, and 1996. Uh, as of May 20th, the amounts of late planting uh, the amount of corn after that date was comparable uh, in those three years in the 90s to what we're experiencing in 2019. But what is startling and different about this year, 2019, compared to those years of really late planting in the 90s, is that decent to really good windows opened up in those years in the 90s, in the last 10 days of May and very early June, and pretty much got both the corn and soybean crops planted in decent shape by the 5th of June. And right now, uh, after the rains this week, the measures that I'm looking at, uh, excess topsoil moisture uh, reading as of Sunday is the highest I've ever seen in the data. So the prospects uh, look really grim, at least for the next week or 10 days of making much more progress in the U.S. on corn and soybean planting. Yeah, uh, final question, uh, any final thoughts, advice, or marketing tips for folks watching that you'd like to share? Well, uh, until today, I would have said, uh, hold on to all your corn, don't sell any corn, and sell beans. Uh, but uh, the market today is uh, showing quite a bit of life on soybeans, which uh, I, I still find a, a little puzzling. 
personally, uh, I'm still, even from these price levels, pretty bullish on corn. Uh, beans, I'm neutral to a bit bearish. I, I still have a hard time seeing that we won't end up with more bean acres total than we had uh, in the March 30th prospective planning report. Uh, just going to see lots, you know, we've got 39 million acres of corn, you know, some X million of those are going to end up in soybeans. The soybean prevent plant dates are much later than for corn. So, and, you know, and the weather forecasts right now are maybe finally around mid-June for a decent planting window to finally open up. And at that point, I think the vast majority of people are just going to say who haven't planted by that date that we're planting soybeans. So uh, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of the uh, run-up in soybean prices right now, even though I realize planting soybeans that late also takes a substantial yield hit, but we can plant a lot of acres of soybeans yet. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Lee Schultz from Iowa State University. We're going to get a look at the pork markets. So if you have a question you'd like for me to ask Lee, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Moving on, and Dean Burbach loves a good challenge. So maybe that's why he and his wife Lisa are dairy farmers. The Hartington family milks the same number of cows they've milked for years, but they've been able to find their niche in the competitive dairy market by providing a unique product line marketed directly from their farm that customers can identify with. And along the way, the family has had to innovate and invent its own processing systems, marketing strategies, and delivery models to build its farm into a successful dairy business. You can read about Burbach's Countryside Dairy in the June Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. And Al, much of the state saw periods of rain and sun this week. How does this week look, especially for those who want to get some planting done? Well, Troy, you're absolutely correct. We did see that heavy rainfall last weekend, and unfortunately, uh, it took a while for things to dry out, but the sun finally did return in earnest. We got the second half of last week. And it has been a wet month, and it has caused some problems planting, not only here in Nebraska, but Corn Belt-wise. If we look at the precipitation summaries in a generalized form for Nebraska for the month of May, the Panhandle and the western side seen anywhere from 3 to 5 inches general coverage. In the eastern half, we were basically in the 3.5 to 6 inch range. The western one-third of the state east of the Panhandle was essentially also in that four to six inch range. The center part of the state, more in the six to eight inch range, the northeastern corner, three to five inch range general coverage, and in the east, central, and southeast. Basically the Omaha, Lincoln area to the southeast of Fall City, anywhere from six to 10 inches was reported. So very wet conditions. Overall, the eastern one third of the state, about two degrees below normal to three degrees below normal, central one third, three to five, and the western one third, anywhere from five to upwards of nine degrees below normal and a lot of that was up in the northwest part of the state where it was very cold. So we've had a very cool May. It looks like we're going to start out June a little bit warmer. So as we go to the upper air pattern, what we'll see is once again another trough in the west, but this one's kind of cut off a little bit. And then we had the general northerly flow from the northern jet stream carved up over the Great Lakes region. So surface high pressure is in control today across much of the upper Midwest. We're expecting fairly sunny skies across the state and warmer conditions as most of the precipitation remains to the east of us and to the south and west of us. And then by tomorrow, that low pressure system really doesn't move much. It doesn't have anything to really push it out. So high pressure will still remain firmly in control. If you notice the clockwise circulation around the surface high, that'll bring a southerly to southwesterly flow. Maybe be some upslope flow convection in the panhandles we go through the afternoon hours but overall dry to the east and then that ridging pattern basically stays in place over the central and southern plains. We do see one piece of low pressure exiting out of that southwest low and a surface low forms in southeastern Colorado. Keeps primary precipitation concentrated in the Texas panhandle in Oklahoma and then that energy will move to the east and we'll start to see a flattening out of the ridge as some of that energy tries to shoot out once again and brings a surface low into southwestern portions of the state. That may generate a few light showers in the afternoon hour across the southwest, but most of the primary activity once again remains to our south. By Wednesday, we see a little bit more of a wavy pattern coming out of the southwest low. Multiple uh, low pressure systems form at the surface, 
should adjust the lift a little bit and bring that a little bit farther to the north. But most of the widespread precipitation once again remains south of Nebraska and to the east of Nebraska until we get to Thursday. And right now the models are prog progressing that low into our region Thursday afternoon. So we see low pressure in southwestern Kansas start to develop. That will bring up some moisture from the Gulf and we will scatter thunderstorm activity. But the most concentrated area once again will be down in the Oklahoma, Kansas region. And by Friday that low starts to move toward the Great Lakes. That will bring cooler weather on the back side of it. And low pressure basically at the surface will help funnel moisture into our region. So we will probably see fairly widely scattered thunderstorm activity, particularly in the eastern half of the state with the heaviest of that moisture well off to our east. If we look even farther down the road next Thursday through the following Tuesday, it looks like we're going to see high pressure contained over the northern plains, giving us warmer than normal conditions, below normal to our south where the low pressure systems will be constantly moving through the region. And in terms of precipitation, with those low pressure systems, we're going to see heavy moisture to our south. So Troy, it does look like the opportunity for drier weather, but let's look out for late next week for some heavier precipitation, but overall, much drier pattern in the next two weeks compared to what we've been through the last two weeks. Thanks, Al. Well, it's the point in the show where we're joined by Market Journal's Bill Dodd to see what he's watching this week. And today he's taking a closer look at how extension educators are helping producers combat and manage pest problems in the field. Bill, take it away. Thanks, Troy. While Nebraska producers are nearing the finish line on planting, some may already be thinking about pest prevention. And two pests on the minds of extension educators this year are the western bean cutworm and the European corn borer. Now of the two, the western bean cutworm is the most likely culprit to be spotted by producers this year. And that's why Nebraska Extension, in coordination with the UNL Entomology Department, have rolled out Western Bean Cutworm Central. This website is a virtual cornucopia of information for producers who are looking for the best information on the pest and the best ways to manage it. While the western bean cutworm has been a historical pest in Nebraska, sightings of the pest have generally been in the western part of the state. However, in recent years, there have been more and more sightings in central and eastern parts of the state as well. So, what kind of information can you find on this site? You might be better off asking, what information can't you find on this site? So on our website, we have a lot of different resources. We have information um, on the basic biology and behavior of the pest. We have a full listing of extension resources that are available, including links to all of those resources. We also have links to um, information that's available from outside of the state of Nebraska, from other trusted resources. We really wanted to bring together all of the different materials that are available about western bean cutworm into one central location, sort of a one-stop shop for farmers, for crop consultants, also for other researchers, um, to be able to find all of the information they need um, about the pest, how to identify it, um, what are the best management practices, what's the current research, and what are recommendations that not just Nebraska, but other extension um, providers across the country are, are recommending. With the adoption of BT crops in recent years, Julie says some producers and crop analysts may have been lulled into a false sense of security, thinking that the pest has been controlled by these management solutions. However, now that we're seeing resistance to the Cry1F trait, we're getting back to a situation where producers need to be on the lookout for the pest and proactively managing it. Julie recommends checking your fields for moth activity, which usually peaks around mid-June to early July. You can cross-reference that with the moth flight data that's found on the website. Furthermore, if you have non-BT fields, those will be critical areas to scout. And speaking of proactive pest management, Nebraska Extension educator Tom Hunt is staying vigilant in the fight against keeping the European corn borer out of the U.S. corn belt for good. Researchers have seen a recent resurgence of this insect in Nova Scotia, and while there have been no reports of field evolved resistance to transgenics in the U.S. as of yet, he believes this technology should hold out for a number of years with proper proactive resistance management practices. However, researchers are keeping a close eye on the situation developing with the species in Nova Scotia, since the region is a low heat unit area, producers there are a lot more reliant on shorter season corn hybrids and there aren't as many selections in terms of transgenic short season hybrids for them to choose from. Tom explains minimal hybrid selection coupled with the possibility of reduced compliance to resistance management may have led to the resurgence and goes on to detail how corn growers can avoid similar problems here in the states. That is planting or making sure there's um, refuge corn, non-BT corn planted. That non-BT corn produces BT susceptible corn borers that can mate with any resistant one that might pop up so it kind of floods out the resistance, it dilutes it. And so we think maybe those two things might have led to the resistance 
uh, that we're seeing. Be vigilant. Um, always check your fields, even though it's BT and it keeps those corn borers down. Take a look at that field. Make sure there's no unexpected damage. If you see some caterpillars in the ear or on the plant, you know it's usually something different, but check them out. Um, it's always good to not use um, single trait hybrids for a pest. Industry and everyone is pretty much going away from that. We're now pyramiding toxins in plants. That means there's two different toxins in a single plant that affect one insect. So if one doesn't kill it, the other will. You know, so, so it's a much less frequent um, resistance development in a situation where you have two different modes of action like that working. But now we're doing okay, but we still, we just need to be vigilant and keep practicing resistance management. I think we'll be, we'll be good for the near future anyway, and soon we'll be pyramids in just about you know, any hybrid in a few years. And so then it'll make it even a higher level of security. But you always have to, always have to, you know, follow the label and, and, and be vigilant. At the moment, the corn borer situation seems to be under control here in the States. But Tom did mention many producers and researchers in the eastern parts of the country closest to the threat have been following things very carefully. And the best course of action for producers here in the Corn Belt is simply to follow suit. The producer should keep an eye out for these pests for the remainder of the growing season. And that's what I've got my eye on this week. Troy, for now, I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Bill. Excited to see what you've got your eye on next week. For our final story today, Nebraska ranks number one in the U.S. when it comes to producing popcorn. In fact, we grow more than 350 million pounds annually. And while popcorn currently contains many nutrients and is a great source for energy, UNL plant geneticist Dr. David Holding is researching ways to up the protein value even more. Cereal grains uh, typically lack several what we call essential amino acids. Um, now the most prominent uh, amino acid that's deficient in cereal grains such as corn and, and sorghum is lysine. There are various strategies we can use to try and raise that lysine so that uh, to bring these cereals into, a, into the realm where they're what we call a complete protein source. So my research has focused um, quite a bit over the years on this Thing called quality protein maize. This is a variety of, of um, dent corn that actually, through a natural mutation in, in a gene called opaque 2, it actually changes the protein profile in, in corn. So the proteins that are deficient in, in lysine um, go down to a, a much lower level, and proteins that are naturally higher in lysine accumulate to a much higher level. Um, and it stemmed from a line called opaque 2 that was discovered more than 100 years ago now. This original variety of opaque 2 had, the, had softer kernels, okay, which is not useful. And then breeders got hold of this opaque 2 and started breeding back in the kernel hardness. But it has this double the amount of the, this essential amino acid lysine. So about five or six years ago, Conagra Foods came to, to UNL and they brought their breeding program with them. And I started a project, kind of fun project, mm -hmm. to try and take this quality protein maize dent corn and cross that with popcorn, which is the same species. This was quite a complicated breeding program because typically when you, when you take dent corn and you cross that into popcorn, you end up with, with corn that doesn't pop, which is obviously mm -hmm. not useful at right. all. Yeah, I can't do so, that. We, so this breeding project was quite, um, challenging in that we had to not only increase the lysine, which was obviously our number one goal, mm -hmm. but, but recover all of the popping, uh, sufficient popping to make this a useful product. When you're increasing the lysine content mm -hmm. uh, in those grains, so I'm sure there's going to be that important nutritional impact, mm -hmm. maybe an important mm -hmm. economical impact. Mm -hmm. What are some specifics you could tell us about that? Well, popcorn improvement uh, in recent years has really focused on just um, maintaining an increasing popping volume, okay? Mm -hmm. There's been very little research into kind of exploring different avenues to Im improve popcorn. So as, as with all um, corn that's, that's grown by farmers, what they're actually growing are hybrid varieties, okay? And this is why we were very careful at the beginning to make multiple different inbred lines of this quality protein popcorn. And we've been successful at that. We have at least six different inbreds and we're, we're basically trying all the different combination, hybrid combinations of those inbreds. What we anticipate from that is that we'll end up with a product that has equivalent popping to the original parents, 
but we're also looking at different the, at the different um, potential ways that we can improve the the uh, agronomics of this. Gotcha. And some people watching may be familiar a little bit with CRISPR. And the right. way I understand it, put very simply, CRISPR is gene editing technology, but at a very, very precise level right. from, from right. what you're telling me. So right. what are some of the ways that you've been using CRISPR in okay. your work? So what we tried to do was to use CRISPR to, again, l reduce the level of these um, storage proteins that, con that contain low levels of, of lysine and increase the levels of other proteins have high lysine. By doing that, we also change the, the protein bodies um, in a way that they're more receptive to the gastric proteases mm -hmm. in the animals that eat them. So what we did was we took, a, um, we took uh, this CRISPR approach and used it to just re simply reduce the level of these dominant storage proteins. What can we expect next as far as how close this is uh, being put into use in the industry or next steps of, of what you see here? Uh, the next stage is, is taking these lines and breeding in those other traits at the same time as removing the CRISPR agent that, that we used for the, for the editing. So the, the gene edits in that prolamin storage protein family are permanent, but the transgene is not. Once those edits have been introduced, we can then get rid of the transgene and end up with a product which is not regulated in the same way that a typical uh, GM trait would be regulated. So it can p uh, potentially hit the market much quicker. Dr. Holding has previously applied this research to sorghum, but with the support of ConAgra Foods, he hopes to achieve a marketable version of higher quality popcorn in the near future. That's about going to do it for this week's show. Next week, we're stopping by Briggs Feed Yard to get a check on the cattle markets with Mike Briggs. And the Nebraska legislature has wrapped up for the summer. Our own Bill Dodd will tell you which agricultural bills passed, which didn't, and why. All that and much, much more. And one more thing before we let you go, Market Journal wants to hear from you. Take our survey that we've posted on our social media pages. I'll see you next week. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.